everybody, and welcome to the IROC Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and welcome to everyone, especially if you've been th with me through 23 episodes. <laughs> um, I'm just glad that I'm going strong. I need to start today with a bit of an apology. So many of you reached out to me last week and kind of thanked me for podcasting, um, even though I was tired from a knitting retreat. I, I should not have, have gone on about being in that right it's a super privileged life you have when you can go to a four-day knitting retreat and come home tired right so my complaints should have fallen on deaf ears no worries everybody just because I was tired and I wanted to sit in my chair and knit that was a little and then um I have to apologize because I made a huge error on the podcast last week and um, had to do some editing um, after it had been up for a while. So some of you heard um, my mistake and some of you didn't, but I was um, contacted by a woman in the, Revel or in the YouTube comments to let me know that all interchangeable needles screw in the same way, righty tighty and lefty loosey. So switching your ends will make no difference. I apologize. I do believe that I had a set of knitting needles at one time that worked. And I'm gonna stick by that. I had to delete those, that three minutes. So some of you that went out into the comments thread and were reading the comments and people were like, wow, that's a great tip. Wow, I really never knew that. And then you didn't hear that tip. <laughs> that's why, because I went back in after and took out that three minutes of, of tip from last week because I thought it was a great one. And I have to be really, really thankful to Carla for not being like angry with me for making her take her whole sweater off the needles at the knitting retreat and put it in the other way because it didn't help, apparently. <laughs> she didn't say a thing to me. That's a good friend, right? When you screw up and they don't like point it out in a mean way. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm the first to admit that I have lots of opinions about knitting and I can make a mistake. So I will just stand firmly in the, I apologize for leading any of you astray. I didn't realize that that couldn't be a thing. Let me say welcome to the 46 knitters who commented back and forth with me this week. Judy Muscroft, Beth Hoskins, Emma, Stephanie, PJ, Debbie M, Kelly, Morning Glory, Cece, who I saw at ZK and helped to learn how to do a little brioche, so she reached out. I hope you finished that hat. Oh, maybe I did, yes, I did see it on Instagram, right? Yes. Uh, Lana, Sue Carey, Cora, Connie, Bereria, Majin, oh, you know what, Megan, well, what a great way to spell that, M-A-Y-G-E-N. I like that. Eileen, Mary B, who always reaches out with a kind and uplifting comment to me. She's a friend in real life, IRL. Uh, Amy B, Suzanne, Amy M, Beverly, Darcy, Fernie, who I saw at Darn It Anyway this last weekend. Hi to a lot of you who might be joining me for the first time because you were one of the 50-some people who took my shawl classes last um, a week ago. Um, Amanda, Andrea, Christine, Kathy G, Helen, Pat, Michelle, Irene. Irene, I want to talk to your two cohorts in crime. You're really good about watching podcasts and making comments. I want them to come over and, and give me a watch so that I can say hello to them too. <laughs> Emily, Marilyn, Carrie, Amber. Amber, what a nice uplifting friend, right? Made comment in my group when I talked to her on the phone twice a week, three times a week, and we text all day. Uh, Freeze Baby, Peggy, Lil Mimi, Amanda C, Cindy, Vonda, Janet, Carol, Sue, LGB6019, and Miss May Travels, who I also met at Darn It Anyway, who has a blog called Miss May Travels, um, and it's a travel blog, so you might want to take a look at that out on the internets. So thank you to all those people for uh, reaching out and saying hello and, and leave me some comments. And a couple of you left me some tips about my crocheting, which I'm not gonna show today, but that's all I've done for the last four or five days is just crochet on that blanket. We went up north. I took seven or eight projects because I never know what I wanna work on. And I worked on one. I had a color work sweater that I was really gonna work on 
I just crocheted. I'm just having so much fun. I think it's fun. I like changing the colors. Uh, I love all the, you know, striping that I'm doing in that blanket. It's just, it's getting huge now. Well, not huge, but it's a fingering weight sweater, so, or blanket, so it grows more slowly. But at the end of the podcast today, I took a bunch of video of the resort that my husband and I stay at many times a year um, in up in northern Minnesota on Lake Winnipegosh, which is about... I'm going to say four and a half hours north of the Twin Cities. So we're getting up there um, in the northern part of the country. It really changed. The landscapes really change. We stay at a fishing resort. So I am not talking about a all-inclusive, pampered, um, fancy, hoity-toity resort. We stay in a little cabin. They've all been remodeled recently. So I give you a little tour of our little cabin where I sit and knit and my husband goes out and fishes. We are right uh, where the Mississippi River flows into Lake Winnebagosh, which is a giant lake. It's one of the, you know, four giant lakes if you look at a map of Minnesota because, you know, we have 10,000 lakes, but there are a couple up in the middle of the state that are really big and it's one of those. Um, and so he loves to fish, especially in the spring. And I... I'm not a big fisher person. I don't even love to go out in the boat um, that much. I mean, I like being on the water if we're going to, um, like in back in the day, water ski and tube and that kind of stuff. But I'm just content to sit in the cabin. They have a really nice lodge with um, a little store and a little game area and, you know, just a, a fireplace place to hang out. And yeah, it's just very cozy. We've, we've known the people that live there, for, you know, we are around for ages and ages. And so I took a little video and one of the things that is really common at this resort are the hummingbirds. She feeds the hummingbirds and there was a flock of hummingbirds. And so I stood by the window where one of the feeders was and took tons of video and I got some in slow motion and it, it was really, it was a fun, you know, half hour of my time spent. So I have some of that for you on video too. And then I took pictures of around the resort and um, you know I'm just going to put it together at the end for those of you that maybe have never been to northern Minnesota and would like to kind of know what what it looks like up there so I'm, I've got to put that together for all of you um what am I going to start with today oh we have a winner 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 chicken dinner uh the I Rock Knits Designs Knit Along which is going all year every two months I draw a winner and so this month was um i did it you know january february and then i did it march april and so this was may june and so anybody who posted in that thread and even someone who posted in at the end at before i got it closed i just left them in there too um and i picked emma from new zealand so the random number generator picked number eight m's little nest hi emma i feel like we're becoming even closer <laughs> friends now that I'm going to give you a prize. Um, she knit the Atta Girl sweater and it's really cute. So she did it in marled yarn and she put three buttons at the top and um, it, it just turned out really cute. She has a picture of it on that thread and I opened the new thread which will be for July and August. So anyone who knits anything in my um, design list, uh, I think I have, I don't know, 28 some patterns out there. So if you knit a hat or a cowl or a sweater um, or shawl or a couple, I have a couple pairs of socks, any, anything that you knit, you can enter to win a $25 gift card to Etsy. And um, so thanks Emma for participating. Thanks for, to the rest of you who put your um, pictures up in there. And it's always fun for me to see. I think that's probably one of the most rewarding parts of being a designer is seeing people knit your items. I have a little purchase to share with all of you. Some of you might be a tiny bit offended by this, but I bought myself a new ring. I saw it on in an Instagram ad and it has a naughty word. So if that's something that offensive, if is offensive to you, I think it's hilarious. So this is my ring. And it says, knit epic shit. <laughs> and every time I look at it, it makes me laugh like that. It's um, just hammered in kind of lightly on this um, round metal disc that I'm wearing on my first finger. 
<laughs> and it had uh, something similar to that on it. And they said that they would do custom designs. And so I was like, oh, okay. I will link that um, person in the, in the show notes that makes mm, custom rings with maybe little naughty sayings on them. Uh, stuff like that just tickles me, right? If I'm in a store and I'm reading those cards, uh, you know, greeting cards or napkins, uh, anything that's kind of naughty, I just, I find a lot of humor in that. Probably says a lot about my maturity level, um, but whatever. <laughs> I just, I thought it was funny. And so I ordered it. I don't think my husband has noticed yet, but I did show my daughter and she was like, rolled her eyes because that's so typical of me, something that I would do. So <laughs> anyway, let's talk about audiobooks because I finished two this time and I started another one this morning at the dog park. So I got up and I got up late and got to the dog park a little late and it got a little hot for Cody. So I got to get myself out of bed because you know, you don't want the dog to be overheated when you're walking at the dog park. So, but I wanted to do extra um, laps because the book was so good. So I finished the second book by Kathleen Flynn. So last time I talked about one, but this time I fixed, uh, finished The Sharper Your Knife, The Less You Cry. And this was her story of going through um, cooking school in France, La Cordon Bleu, the cooking school. And um, as a kind of a grown adult, um, she just decided to, um, she got laid off from her job and she didn't know what she was gonna do. So she did that and I liked just the easy writing of her other book. And she has um, a couple of other ones out there, The Kitchen Counter Cooking School. I may listen to that coming up here. Um, but she's living in London. Um, she has a boyfriend um, in the United States and she loses her job and he says, you know, go for it. I'll move with you and they do and I found it just fascinating all of the things she learned about food and cooking and then their life um, being people who had never lived in Paris before and not really knowing the language which you really should know when you go to Le Cordon Bleu because the chefs speak in French so she had taken French in high school but yeah if, if that is um, of interest to you it has four stars on Audible. Um, the narrator was Cassandra Campbell's. I think she did a, a, you know, a great job. And so I'll just show you here. The Sharper Your Knife. It's the little cover, Kathleen Flynn. So yeah, I would highly recommend that one. And then I went out to look at a book list for someone. I was recommending a book, maybe even on Instagram or something and I went to Audible to look because I love Alan Eskins. He's written a number of books um, placed here in Minnesota. I'm sure I've talked about him on the podcast before and I was scrolling through his books. I was looking for the title of maybe the third one I read and I couldn't quite remember it and I found one that I hadn't read. I think I found two I hadn't read which I was really surprised about but what I think happened is that the books came out and then the audio recordings were done a bit later and so I wasn't aware because the audiobooks weren't out at when the books came out. So this is called The Guise of Another and it's a nine hour 21 minute and it's narrated by Jonathan Yen who I think does a really really nice job. This is what it looks like, Alan Eskins. Oh, maybe I need to bring that back a little bit. And he writes about um, the setting of in Minnesota, but this I would call a um, murder mystery uh, in kind of intrigue. A former Medal of Valor winner, Minnesota detective Alexander Rupert is now under subpoena by a grand jury on suspicion of corrup corruption. So when he's asked to look into the false identity of a car accident victim named James Putnam, a man who in fact died 15 years earlier, Rupert sees a potential big case and an opportunity to regain his respectability. So when you read one of the first books that Alan Eskins wrote, it's about a young man going to the University of Minnesota and he's a reporter. And then in the next book, he, um, he is graduated and you're following a completely different storyline. And then he, in the, one of the book, another book, he meets a police officer named Max Rupert. And then one of the books is uh, he writes about Max Rupert. So although the books are not chronological in order or um, even related, there's a character from a previous book in the new books. 
Does that make sense? So this one, Max Rupert, his brother Alexander, they're both on the police force. And so the story is told about those two men that were characters in previous books. I'm not sure I was really clear right there. I could probably re-say all that, but <laughs> I think you'll understand um, what I'm talking about. Is that the characters are continuous in throughout the book, some of the characters. There must be a name for that. I bet there's a, a literary term for books that have that delve into the backgrounds of different characters. Hmm, oh, somebody look that up for me or I will. Anyway, so I really, really enjoyed that. But it, I, I couldn't stop listening to it. In my shawl class that I taught at Darn It Anyway, someone asked a really pertinent question in the class and I said that I would definitely talk about it after the break. So we took a break and I went shopping in the store because the question was about how do you know how yarn is going to behave when you look at it in the skein and it doesn't always look like what it looks like when you're done knitting the product. So we talked about re-skeining yarn and there were, I, I taught Oh, I don't know, um, like 24 women in the morning and 20 some in the afternoon. So I had, you know, about 50 people. And I would say that there were a large proportion of those women, I had all women, um, that did not understand the concept of reskinning yarn and hand dyed, um, indie dyed yarn. So I want to discuss that briefly here today. So what I did is I went out into the shop, this I went into my stash, and found a skein of yarn that has been uh, dyed by an indie dyer, and um, I took the label off this, um, but it is dyed in big chunks of color, right? But when you look at this, you're not exactly sure how it's going to knit up and then what color the final product is going to be. So if we unskein the yarn while we're in the store, or even at home, you can go find a skein that you own. This has been laid out in a pan and color has been placed on it in a circular fashion. So they put a big splotch of yellow right here and a big splotch of orange right here. And then the orange goes into kind of a pink. And then we've left some of the yarn natural here. And then there's some more pink and then some more orange. So you see how that yarn has been dyed? When you knit with this yarn, you are not going to get sections of pink and orange and yellow because the section that has been dyed is just a small strand of that that is going to be yellow. So you're going to get that many stitches of yellow and then you're going to move on and you're going to get that many stitches of pink and you're going to you know go around and that's going to continue to keep happening and the and you can when you swatch start with a color as opposed to starting with an um anywhere in the skein and you can figure out about how many stitches you're going to get in each uh section and you can figure out whether or not your yarn is going to pool depending on the circumference of what you're knitting. So you might be knitting a sock and the yarn is pooling like crazy, but then you knit it into a hat and it doesn't pool at all. But that's just because you've spread out the number of stitches. So I skeined up the yarn into a skein. And although red is gonna blow out a little bit on the camera, this is more what your final project is gonna look like, right? Lots of pink little bit of yellow, little bit of orange, little bit of white. So it's the difference between this skein that you look at in the store on the hook that has big chunks of color. I didn't wind that up quite well enough, but there's big chunks of color, but this is how it's gonna knit. So they do look quite different, correct? Some yarn dyers will re-dye their yarn. And I went out online to see what I could find as far as pictures that people posted in their groups. So here's one that is not re-skeined. And then they rewound it on a ball winder in, you know, in a different, 
not really a different circumference, but they just rewound it so that everything plays together. And then you get the idea of this is how it was dyed. And this is how it really is going to knit up. Okay, I have a whole bunch of these. Because before I want, found my own yarn to do for you. So this is how it was dyed. And this is more how it's going to knit up. So in this particular one, you might say to yourself, well, is this gonna be a gray sweater, a white sweater, or a red sweater that I'm knitting? Well, it's definitely gonna be gray, right? More gray with a little bit of red and white. But this section right here makes it look like it's as much as that section right there. So it can be hard to, to, to kind of differentiate. Here's another one. So here's the yarn dyed, and here's the yarn. Here's the yarn dyed, and here's the yarn reskeined. And this is, was from Simply Sock Yarn Company blog. Uh, Allison posted these pictures of some sock yarn. So you could go out and take a look at that. But like I said, some yarn dyers will, re will reskein their yarn. Leading Men Fiber Arts reskeins all of their yarn. I haven't really talked to them about their rationale for doing that, but one of the things that I would think might happen to a yarn dyer is that someone might buy this and say to them, how is this gonna knit up? And if they don't have a swatch, which Leading Men Fiber Arts has a swatch book of, of all their colorways, so you can look and see exactly how it's going to knit up, be knit, um, you might come back later and say, boy, I didn't like the way this knit up because I didn't know that it was gonna look like this. This is not the way that I thought that the yarn was gonna knit up. So maybe that's the rationale for why. I think in some yarn booths, they will have one skein that's been reskeined because the process of taking it from this to this takes some time, right? You have to put it on a yarn or ball winder, even if you have an electric one, um, and, and rewind it, 400 yards can take several minutes. So for a yarn dyer to take the time to do that is costing them time and money in their dye studio. And so I think some yarn dyers would allow you to take a skein and wind it up to see what it might do, and others would say, absolutely not, you can't take a skein and go wind it up. It's you know a matter of what how they can resell the yarn. They could, uh, rewind it back into its matching up of all of the colors in a kind of a color pooling. But I just found it fascinating that there were so many women in my knitting groups that didn't really understand or realize the concept of, of reskeining and maybe hadn't buy, bought a lot of indie dyed yarn. I mean, that's something that not everybody has access to, especially if you're not spending a lot of time in, in a local yarn store and your local yarn store may carry indie dyed yarn that's not dyed in this fashion. <laughs> so there, nobody, these are, a, this is a certain way of dyeing by putting color only on certain parts of the skein. And so maybe, you know, maybe the yarn in your shop doesn't look like that. And so you would have no reason to know that. I just wanted to talk about it briefly and show you the visual because I think that's what really helps. We can talk about reskeining and people don't know what you're saying and then they don't understand the concept of it. And so I just wanted to kind of bring that up as the tip of the day today is that uh, reskeining yarn can really help you know where you're headed with the color that you're going to get from the yarn that you've picked. Okay. Also, when you get home, sometimes these skeins you know, will look a little bit different on the outside when you dye them up. They might be a little more of one color on the skein because it's not an exact science. They're not drawing a line in the yarn and saying I'm only dyeing exactly three inches of this color. Might be three and a quarter on one of the skeins might get a little more dye and a little bit wider, you know, area. So that's another reason that skeins can really, when you're knitting with them, let's say you have two skeins side by side, one can have a lot more pink in it just by accident, just even though the dyer is being intentional in their dyeing. So, you, you know, be wary, but also when you're shopping or if you're in a indie yarn booth at a, an event, you can look at the yarn a little bit differently by just knowing having a little bit more knowledge about that, that dyeing process. 
So let's talk about the sweater and the shawl of the day today. Let's start with the shawl. This is the Color Affection by Vera Valamaki. This is a beautiful shawl that thousands of knitters knit. Um, it is fingering weight. It takes about three colors of uh, fingering weight skeins. It is asymmetric. It is knit in one piece. It has short rows. It has stripes or color work. It is top down. It is written pattern. And the fingering weight version is 94 and a half inches or inches long and 16 inches wide at the widest part. And I will say that's probably pretty accurate for mine too. So I'll show you the pattern. Color Affection by Vera Valamaki. Probably one of the, I think 16,000 knitters have knit this. And it was, it came out in December of 2011 and I still see a few of these shawls coming up in my feed. Um, I'm surprised that these uh, pictures are not the ones that I'm gonna refer to here. But let me show you the three pictures over here a little bit better. On the front page of the pattern is a picture of the shawl hanging on a tree or a bush. It's hanging. It's a big crescent shawl. And the reason that I always bring this shawl to my shawl class and talk to people about um, this and tell a little story is this. There are always times in a knitter's life when the knitter thinks they know a little bit better than the designer what they're doing, right? We've all had that moment when we're like, yeah, I think, I think that's not really what the designer wanted me to do, so I'm gonna change it or tweak it or fix it a little. And most of the time, that can work out quite well. The situation that happened with this particular shawl is that a few people made a few comments on their project pages and thousands of knitters went with it <laughs> and followed it. So the issue was the top edge of the shawl being this edge where you're carrying colors up because this is striped yarn. Let me turn it a little bit. There we go. So you're starting with green and then you're doing green and yellow and then you're doing orange and green and yellow. Now, my third color was variegated. And so it makes it look like I have red and orange in this section, but that's just because my yarn was variegated and that was not called for in the pattern. But I had th these three skeins of wool Misa yarn in my stash and I wanted to use them in the, in the pattern and I didn't think it would matter too much, but now when I take it to class, it's a little, it looks a little less uh, geometric than some of the other striped shawls because mine has this variegation on the bottom. But that top edge starts out with this green section and it's, it's rather long. You're doing garter stitch for a, a period of time and then you are carrying the color along the side there, uh, you know, as you go up because you don't want to cut every time you go over and back, you don't want to cut your yarn because you would have to weave in, you know, a, a thousand ends. And so you're carrying the color up the edge. And so someone, and I, I have no idea who the first couple people were, um, said, my edge is too tight. So I think that you should do a yarn over at the edge of the shawl and then drop the yarn over off when you come back to it to give yourself some more string yarn uh, in between those side edge stitches so that the edge will not be so. And that's a tip or trick that people have used on shawls for a long time. However, the next person put it on their pattern page and then the next person, the next person, and it kind of became a viral tweak of the pattern where everyone was thinking that they needed to figure out how to do a yarn over at the edge and it wasn't written the pattern. And then is that something that we really want to include? Yes, everybody's doing it. And it kind of got its own <laughs> momentum. And Vera Valamaki never intended to have that top edge be flat and so many knitters wanted to block that top edge of the shawl flat 
that and that wasn't allowed when it, you're making a crescent. But she wanted a crescent shawl. She wanted the shawl to be shaped like a crescent. I had never talked to her about this, but I kind of watched this whole dilemma go down in 2011, maybe 12 even and into 13, where people were like, well, everybody's doing it, so I should do it that way. And I never saw that she came out and said, come on, people. You're tweaking with the pattern here, but there's no reason that you should be doing that because I wanted it to be a crescent. I wanted that top edge to be, a, you know, not tight, but a little firm because that also supports the shawl. So sometimes when you're out re re reading lots of projects on, you know, Ravelry, things can go a little off center because uh, someone thinks that their idea is the thing that did it hurt the shawl if you did that? Absolutely not. But I chose not to add the yarn overs on the edge of the, I always just say, if you want something to be, you know, loose, think loose thoughts, <laughs> right? If you just kind of think about it a little bit, it has a tendency to, you know, I'm not gonna carry that yarn up the side quite so tightly if I'm thinking, you know, that I want it to be loose. So uh, I just find it funny because the picture on the front page of the pattern is of this beautiful shawl that's in a crescent shape. And a lot of the patterns um, that where people are shown blocking it, they're, they've tried to make it flat so that the bottom all just hangs down below. And I think, oh, that's just so sad that that happened to her. Now, I'm going to try to explain a little bit about how this shawl um, can be styled. And I may stand up and move my chair. I've never done this before, but I'm going to give it a What try. I like to do when I'm going to wrap a shawl around and I want it to stay on, I tend to anchor one of the ends in place. So what I have done here is that I've taken the sh this piece of the shawl this edge and I've wrapped it up and over this shoulder and then I am going to trap it with this part of the shawl right here. So that garter stitch piece right here on this garter stitch piece will help hold that in place because I've got all this extra tail right here wrapped over that shoulder. So that kind of traps it. And then what I've done is I take this piece and I'm gonna trap it over that shoulder. So I'm gonna go underneath here and up and over this shoulder. And if I can get that long piece up and over this shoulder, right here, then that will trap that in there naturally. Then I can do all kinds of, you know, changing in the front here. I can pull this whole thing forward and I can have a bit of a cowl here hanging down. But what I've actually done is locked into place each of the shoulders so that the more, I wish my mannequin could move around, but the more that the mannequin moves around, or the person, <laughs> that mannequin's just gonna take off on me. Okay, so the more that you move around, this piece will stay locked in. And so it's just a matter of any long shawl you have. The thing I like to do is wrap it over my shoulder, lift up one edge and then flop that up and over before I pull that around. Because if I just take this, let's do it the other way, right? I've wrapped this around my shoulder. And this is what I think a lot of people do. So they wrap that over their shoulder and then they take this end and they bring it up and over and then they take this end and they bring it up and over and that falls off all day long, right? These two pieces are gonna just continue to fall off the shoulders over and over and over again. So I think by locking in one shoulder, at least one shoulder, the rest of this can just hang forward. You can do, you can bring this all up here and have a lot of extra fabric. That's gonna just hold that in place. You're not gonna have a lot of trouble with that moving around all day. So let me take this off and show you what it actually looks like in all of its glory. So here is the one end and you're just doing short rows. That's what causes this little thing to happen right here every time because you're only working over to here. 
and then you've got this green piece in this section. Okay, and that's just shirt rows the whole way. So it's a really fun knit. It's very, very long and fairly narrow. I mean, it's garter, so it, um, it stretches out some when you wear it. I've worn it a ton. And again, wrap it around the shoulder and take this piece up and over. And then I just would adjust that and I would bring this up over the top. And it will stay right there all day. And this can all come up over your bust. Some people with a large bust don't want that across their bust. So you can just then, once you've got it locked into place, you can just continue to kind of bunch it up. Okay. And then while I'm standing, I'll talk briefly about this one that I'm wearing. This is my uh, cropped cotton cardi pattern. And I just finished this uh, a couple weeks ago um, before I went to ZK, I wore it. And it's a rainbow cropped cotton cardi in bulky. So I knit it with uh, Classic Elite Provence and I held it triple. So I did two strands of yellow and one strand of gold two strands of bright orange and one strand of dark orange, two strands of bright red, one strand of dark red, all the way down, two strands of purple, and one strand of kind of a raspberry, two strands of dark blue and one strand of light, and then two strands of light green and one strand of dark. So I had a big box of yarn, and I've been wanted to do this for a long time. I'm gonna put my chair back in. So I held it triple and it makes for a pretty heavy sweater. The cropped cotton cardi that I have out on Ravelry is a free pattern in one size that I wrote years ago with some cotton yarn that I had in my stash that I wanted to knit up with. I think I ended up using 24 or 27 colors of just random scraps of cotton and it turned out really cute. You can go out and look at the that pattern, but I have recently hired a new um, graphics graphic artist to redo my website, and she is also a grading tech editor. And so I'm going to have her help me regrade this into a um, number of sizes, but I think I'm gonna do it with two strands of yarn instead of three, so it's not quite so heavy. So you can look for that to probably come out in early fall um, as I get it knit up here and we can kind of move forward. I have had a number of people knit this up holding three strands of yarn double. It doesn't have to be cotton. Um, and if you're like a 40-42, you can follow that pattern. And it's just got raglan increases um, and just a short body. It's not, I wouldn't call it, I called it cropped at the time, but now I feel like cropped is like upper high waist, um, what they're wearing. And this was more like high hip. Um, and then the one I have on is quite long. I kept going in an A-line. I just kept increasing down the side seam and made it A-line and made it as long tunic length so that each of these sections was rather large all the way down. And then I sewed my button band shut. <laughs> I did make buttonholes at the time, but they because the yarn was so heavy, it they weren't very pretty buttonholes. So I once I buttoned it, I didn't really like the way the buttonholes looked. So. I stitched that shut so that it would lay really nice and you guys all know that tip or trick now. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about when wearing a long uh, shawl like this is because I have these laying here and I forgot to talk about them, are uh, shawl pin sticks that you can get um, at any type of Claire's kind of jewelry store. Uh, you can also get them online if you are used to be a bun wearer, you used to be able to stick these in. But you can get these for quite inexpensive, anywhere from a dollar to three dollars. This one has a jade uh, flower and stone on the end of it. It's really pretty. It's got a little stone. But you can use them to help anchor your shawl once you've knit it or you've got it right where you want it. 
and that would just keep it in place. So I have them with feathers and I find that these really stay in well. So if I'm sticking this one in here, it, um, and I saw with blue feathers, I have some really pretty ones. I have a wavy black one. I have a brown if you're a neutral person. I have a brown one. I have a really pretty red one with little flowers all over it. So yeah, I have enough to kind of, um, you know, make a change. And I don't have a problem with these falling out, but I have had people say in my classes that they have had trouble with them uh, falling out. I think sometimes it's the way you stick it in and you have to kind of anchor it down, the thick part down into the, the shawl. But yeah, I, I really like using just a straight pin kind of to, to anchor a shawl that I'm wearing. So I'll leave that one in there. That's your styling uh, tip for the day. I hope that that all worked out because I stopped and started the recording several times. Am I still recording? Yes. Okay, then let's um, end here with uh, the sweater of the day. Right. This is the Hitafude sweater, and I have this mannequin propped up on a box today. I found a big uh, kind of flat box so it can be a little higher, so I hope that it'll be easier for everyone to see. Um, I talked about my knitting of the hero sweaters in a previous podcast where I knit hero sweaters and hung them on a line at the dog park. Remember that story? Um, I think that was maybe three or four years ago. And I gave heroes to everyone that I loved. <laughs> everyone got a hero sweater. The following year, my friend Megan knit Hitafude sweaters for 12 people in her life. She loved this sweater um, and knitting it so much that she decided that she would knit a sweater every month and then gift them to people during that month. And then at the end of that 12 months, the following year, all 12 of us got together and sent pictures and we had a calendar made for her. And I was Miss April <laughs> because my sweater came to me for my birthday in April. But here's the Hitafude. It's a really pretty open front lace cardigan. It came out in October of 2013. It's a fingering weight sweater um, using size four needles. It is A-line in shape. It is elbow to sleeve length. It is knit um, flat in one piece. It has a provisional cast on. It has a three needle bind off. It's knit top down. Um, the pattern is available for $2 USD. Originally, the pattern was um, written in, um, was offered in yen or something. It was thousands and thousands of yen, but it still came up to be just a few dollars, you know, a few dollars. So I think this is a new price um, for this one. It also is in, available in French and um, Hirofude means single brush stroke in Japanese. So one brush stroke would be a Hirofude. And this sweater is knit in one stroke. You start at one end, You, I'll tell you about the construction, but then you go all the way through the whole sweater. And if your yarn skein is large enough, you finish and you will have two ends to weave in, one at the beginning and one at the end, because it's knit in one stroke, the entire thing. So I think that's the piece that really intrigued people about knitting this was that it was such an interesting construction. Um, you would cast on, hmm, how am I gonna show this best? You'll cast on from over here all the way across to over here provisionally, one long piece. And then you knit the lace going up and over, but you're just making a piece of lace that then would fold. And then you cast off for either underarm by three needle binding off that section together. And then you work back and forth from the front edges all the way down. So super interesting. Um, really fun uh, lace pattern, which I think you can see, I put the white shirt on underneath here so you could see. I would say that you're probably not best served to do it in a highly variegated yarn, but Megan went to her stash 
and tried to find the most colorful thing she could in order to knit mine. If you go out on her project page, which is just run knit, she has a gray one and a cream one and a blue one. I mean, she has a lot because she knit 12 of them. She has a lot of colors. The reason that I think she went kind of down this path was because we were discussing this in the car and the original sweater in a smaller size was quite short. It was up quite a bit and quite um, skimpy. I don't know if this picture really shows it that well, but it's this one right here. There's not full coverage in the front and, um, and it, it rode up a little bit, as you can see that it does here, right here, rides up a little bit. And so I had said flippantly, like I do, I'll never knit that sweater. That's a belly and boob sweater. <laughs> because when you wear a sweater like this, and you all that have a bigger front side <laughs> will understand that if an open front sweater falls to the side and of your breast, then it will stay over there and it won't stay up here, right? And then when it does that, when you walk into a room, your belly and your boobs walk in before the sweater does. <laughs> that's always been my feeling. Now, that's just me, right? Like that's just me being funny and <laughs> it doesn't really bother me that much that I have a, you know, a larger chest than, you know, some people. But the way that this construction happens with this cast on piece is that you get this little piece right here. And if that hits you and you're really large busted, there's no way for this to have full coverage. So I said that to Megan and Megan said, I can fix that. She knew that by knitting the first, the couple that she first knit, I think she knit herself one and then she knit her mom one and then she knit Ellie one. Um, that she had a way to increase the length and also knit a larger size in order to make for more coverage in the entire sweater, which is what she did, I think, for several of the people that she knit for, because there were a number of us that were larger than Megan and wouldn't be, have been felt flattered by this particular sweater. And so her, her notes on my project page, which is on her page, um, would say how she made the bottom longer and also did more increases to provide more coverage around a larger person's rear end or hips, bust, really worked well. So this mannequin, remember, is a man, <laughs> so it doesn't have a chest, although it has a large chest circumference, so it works for putting sweaters on. If I pull these like this, you can see that there is much more coverage on the front of this sweater than there is in the original one, which would not do this, could not cover this. And when I wear it, I it will stay forward like this for me over kind of my bust right here. It will stay forward because there's enough additional ease on it. Making the bigger size, however, did make the sleeves be a little more, little wider than probably the traditional one, which were maybe a little more trim fit. And um, it's just a lovely design. I would um, love to knit one now in, you know, a, a real bright color. I think it would be really fun to have in my wardrobe. I usually wear something solid underneath it so that the you know, that lace really shows. I mean, that's a lot of work in doing that lace pattern. Well, not a lot of work because it's not a hard one, but to do that lace pattern and not really have it show up so much in this really fun, super, super color fragilistic, something like that was the name of the colorway. I think it's a Miss Babs, um, which was um, one of the skeins that had enough of a yardage put up that if you knit the whole thing, um, you could get, you wouldn't have any ends to weave in. And that is true of a lace weight skein. So if you get a heavy lace weight skein, a lot of people did it in that because then they could knit the whole thing without having ends to weave in. So that was the beauty of kind of the smaller, more petite one. And the, the designer is from Japan. Um, and I do think that there are a lot of Japanese women who are quite petite. Um, and so the, the fit was probably perfect. And then um, we all, <laughs> 
we all fell in love with it too. So there are 7,000 projects, over 7,500 7, projects, um, and it's in 10,000 people's queues. So it's still very popular, still being knit all the time. Oh, I was going to read you the bus sizes. So the bus sizes go from an extra small of a 28 to 32, a small 32 to 37, a medium 37 to 41, a large 41 to 45, an extra large 46 to 50, and an extra extra large 50 to 54. So it has a pretty broad range of sizes um, that could probably make it work for um, you know more people. It is a gauge of 20 stitches and 32 rows and four inches. Uh, yeah, I, I just think it's a really nice um, nice sweater. Lots of people knit it. You could go out and look at project pages to see if there's someone out there who looks like you and if that would be something that would, you know, really flatter in your wardrobe, the Hit a Food A cardigan. Okay, I'm going to finish up today with a question that I had from a viewer that I answered in my Ravelry group. So go over there and join the Ravelry group and kind of join that discussion. Um, questions for Corey is always stickied at the top of the thread. So if you do have a question for me, I try to answer them kind of every few days I'm out there looking. And the question this time was from someone who had a knitted sweater where the hem flipped up. And I have seen that happen on a lot of sweaters um, and I've had to fix it on a sweater of my own. And there is a blog post on the Mason Dixon blog about fixing it after the fact. Once the sweater is done and it um, flips up, there is a blog post out there so you could put hem flip or something. But this is a really good article that I had printed out and put in my... Um, advanced beginners notebook for things I want to teach them as we move forward. And this is from the craft sessions, how to stop your knitted hem from flipping up. And it is many pages long, but basically the problem with a hem flip is the change in tension from the ribbing to the stockinette of the body. That change in tension will cause the hem to flip up or to, to lay flat. And so, she talks about why it happens a lot about you know why it happens and then she has um, three tricks for making it not happen anymore so i'm going to just read you that because this is really not my information to give i'm not acting as if it's mine i'm going to give you the tricks and then you can go out and read them from her blog right because I've used these tricks and it was, she has them all in one place. So these are, are things that I have found out from different classes that I've taken and then she put them all together, which is really nice. So the first trick is to de decrease the number of stitches. You decrease it by knit two together every few stitches across the row on the last row of stockinette or on the first row of rib or on the first row of stockinette for a bottom up sweater and the last row of rib, depending on which direction you're going, right? And there are no rules. She can vary it, you know, depending, knit two together, knit eight. But Elizabeth Zimmerman re recommended knit two together, knit three for a slight, straight sleeve. If you're going down to the down a sleeve and that's how you want to do it. So she tells you how to figure that out in this blog post. And very succinctly, I will say. Then, so trick two is to decrease the needle size. So you, changing needle size can help. And trip, trick number three is slip stitches, which I have used um, before on something that someone in, I think they even mentioned it in the pattern, like in order to not have this hem flip, slip the stitches in the, the band. And I used it because <laughs> the person told me to. So anyway, sh this is Felicia. She is the craft se sessions blog. She has, tons of great information out there but if you have had that problem or you have a sweater now where your hem flips up and you want to fix it you can go back and fix it there are a couple ways to do it one is by looking at the mason dixon um, blog um, i think it was k maybe that had a problem with the sweater and how she fixed it and she took pictures and told people how to do it and then 
this is three more tricks or tips for how to make that not happen. So I hope that this uh, podcast finds you well today. It's a beautiful, bright, sunny day in Minnesota, Minneapolis area. Cody is um, laying at my feet sleeping. I think I really wore him out by getting him hot at the dog park. They have a pump, a water pump at the dog park. And when we got done, he went right to the pump and was like, Mommy, you, you need to push the button on the pump so that um, it'll pump up some cold water for me. And he stood and dr drank for a couple of minutes. There is water. Um, there were some water bowls in the dog park, but he is finicky that way. He'll sniff a bowl, and if it doesn't smell just right for him, he won't drink the water out of the bowl. I think he'd be a good on a wilderness adventure because he might keep you from drinking, you know, bad water. <laughs> so he smelled in one of the bowls, and he didn't want to, I don't know if it had been left over from the night before or it rained or, or whatever, but... Thanks so much for joining me today. I cannot tell you what an adventure this has been um, for me to meet so many of you, talk to so many of you, uh, answer questions for you, uh, have you give me tips and tricks and things that have worked for you. It is. It really has become a dialogue, even though I'm talking to an iPod in my dining room room sitting, <laughs> sitting by myself. Uh, I have just really enjoyed this doing this podcast it, it brings me great joy i never regret um having to sit down on a monday morning so ignore me if i'm complaining <laughs> and i'm going to insert that video that i took this weekend um, of our cabin and the campground and all that at the end of the podcast and until next time keep it colorful and waddle on Mississippi River flows from up there quite a ways to the west it would start but then we are right on the mouth where it opens in to Lake Winnebogosh right over there so the giant leg lake is Right out here. Here are the lakefront cabins. And the swings, which you can sit on at night to watch. Boats coming in on the lodge, another swing. Got the main lodge going this way. And then some more cabins up there. Everyone's eating supper, so all the cars are in. And they're Fishing off the dock this morning and catching crappie. This is our little cabin. There's two bedrooms. There's the first bedroom. There's the second bedroom. It's all decked out in. There's the bathroom. And here's the kitchen. And two windows there. TV in the corner. And bring it around. Some air conditioning and extra heat. Yeah, yeah,